good evening. Hello, hello. Hello. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. I am Peter Magyar, Department Head of the Department of Architecture. And today is again a beautiful evening with an incredibly beautiful lecture, as I assume. Uh, as you know, Steve Helen Stangeland and Reinhard Kropf are the principals of Helen and Hard Architects, who are the, this year's, the 2010-2011 uh, Renier Chair of, of Architecture. Only one of them are representing both of them, but I think uh, our students already visited and there was some interaction with the whole firm. And uh, in some other cases, I hope that we can see both of you here. They established uh, the company in 1996 in Stavanger, Norway. They have a wide spectrum of projects from interior architecture to art to urban design. They have received many awards and honors, including the Norwegian National Award for Good Building and Environmental Design for the Pulpit Rock Mountain Lodge in Norway, second prize for the Norwegian Pavilion uh, in the uh, Expo in, in Shanghai. One of eight European firms exhibited at the New Trends Architecture in Tokyo, and also Lisbon, Stockholm, and many others, New York, many other places, they, they successfully competed and won competitions and works. I knew them first from this magazine of the RIBA, the Royal Institute of British Architects, where they have this beautiful uh, cover photo, or uh, actually it's a, a computer-generated drawing, and in the inside there is a very interesting quotation which I would like to leave as a very challenging introduction to this, this evening. The architect is using this opportunity to push its fascination with the organic nature of timber as a material and the nature of the digital design process to metaphorical levels. So I hope we will see these metaphors and also the materiality in the work. Mr. Kropf studied in the Austria University of Technology in Graz and at the Oslo School of Architecture and Design. He has taught in the Ecole Speciale de Architecture in Paris and the Oslo School of Architecture and Design. As you know, the Victor Renier Visiting Faculty China Architecture at Kansas State University is funded by Victor and Helen Renier Family Foundation of Mission, was established in the 2003 by Renier's children, Victor Renier and Robert E. Renier and Catherine Renier. Please help me welcome Mr. Kropf as the hard part of <laughs> thank you, Peter. And uh, first, I want to thank you for inviting me so kindly to come here and uh, to, to teach and to lecture. Thank you, Torgai, uh, and all of you. Um, I'm first want to introduce our office. Maybe we can put the light off, thank you. Um, uh, Helen and Hart consists of 18 um, architects from, um, or 19, sorry, we just employed a new one, uh, from eight different nationalities. Uh, we have even have one from Kansas, uh, Caleb. Um, and uh, it's a wonderful team and um, here you see my partner, Sief Helene Stangeland. I'm starting my lecture um, showing some images um, from a 
three square meter area in front of our cabin, uh, which is a big inspiration for us, for our work, has been all the time. So it, these are observations from our weekly walk along the coastline. And um, what we, we are kind of fascinated how uh, this strange organic and unorganic conglomerates uh, along the coast uh, are kind of emerges or constantly change and um, self-organize. And um, we got more and more interested in morphogenesis, and this really changed completely our way to look uh, the, our attitude or our mindset towards um, space, uh, as well as space generating processes. And, um, and, and we kind of try to implement that in our work. The philosopher uh, Friar Matthew and uh, Michel Serres, which has been important for us, a, a big inspiration, they um, claim that it, it, um, what is needed is a new uh, understanding that uh, matter and nature has its own um, imminent dynamic unfolding potential. And, uh, and this is sometimes ignored or repressed or, of us. And, and they say that this is important uh, instead of imposing our ideas on the world as architects uh, and, and try to, to kind of instrumentalize it. We should try to, to create a, um, a, kind of, a kind of a partnership or a connect, connectedness uh, with, with the environment around and um, explore its, its space generating potential. And this is kind of this um, mutual encounter and unfolding um, of humans and matter and the environment, um, which kind of uh, which which outlines our our idea of a relational space or mingled space, like uh, the title of my lecture, and that is what I want to talk about it today. In our work, we um, we kind of try to to to, to intertwine um, contextual qualities with uh, human resources and human behavior and uh, the kind of intrinsic potential of, of matter into a relational space. And the projects I'm showing today are um, attempts to, to work with this relational space and, and uh, to, to, to weave that together. I will show first uh, two um, more experimental projects, and then followed by, yeah, more conventional, arch not conventional, but architectural tasks. The first, uh, the first project is a, uh, a contribution to an exhibition which is called The Rest of Now in uh, the Biennale for Contemporary Art Manifesto. Um, it was in 2008 in Bolzano in North Italy, and the, the title of our installation was The Naked Garden. We were asked to make a site-specific intervention in an abandoned uh, aluminum factory uh, built under the regime of um, Mussolini in the 30s. It was a very kind of monumental space and a, a beautiful space. And, and what really struck us, what this kind of the power demonstration of a space was in a, in a nearly parasitic way occupied and, and uh, overgrown by, by microorganisms. And um, this was a, a temporary state because of the ongoing, at that time, ongoing preservation and, and building work. So we, we wanted to, to, to keep that state and um, uh, demanded that our exhibition wall uh, is not going to be painted, and, and that we keep the conditions, including the microorganisms. And we uh, took samples from the wall and gave it to a um, uh, biologist to, to analyze these um, samples. And they found um, cyanobacteria and fungi. And um, 
we gave that, and, and they gave us films about uh, the, the grow of this fungus, this type of fungi we found in the wall. And um, then we had uh, a collaboration with the mathematician who helped us to transform this, the growth pattern of the fungus into an, a, a logarithm, which was used then to program a robot which uh, water jet cuts uh, the pattern, the, the growing rules of the, after the growing rules of the fungi, which are inhabiting the, the wall. And um, this was a company from, from Stavanger, which normally works with, um, the, in the oil industry. And um, they, uh, depending how fast this um, arm is moving, they cut in different depths in the wall. So you get um, different holes. And then the, then the, the brick, uh, the, the, colored, uh, the water which splashes out, colored from the brick, makes these strange paintings around. So here you see it goes all the way through in some points. Um, and uh, so this was a kind of weaving together what I, I said in the, in the beginning of different um, knowledge fields or different um, ways to approach space. Here you see the original um, fungus. And uh, we, we had the luck that this piece was sold to the municipality of uh, Bolzano. So it's, it's not a temporary installation, but became a permanent one. And our office had a trip to Bolzano. The second project is a, uh, a pavilion for play uh, with the name Ratotosk. Uh, we were invited among six other architects from the Victoria and Albert Museum in London to, um, in, 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 for an exhibition with the title uh, Architects Build Small Spaces. And, uh, and we uh, kind of um, thought, what, how did we play as children? We played a lot in the, in the forest, in, in trees. And, and, and there were these uh, play places, and, and the play, there was no... Uh, no difference. The play places were ma made by play, and then this kind of blending. We thought, how could we kind of use that to make, to create a design process? And we uh, ended up with five uh, different methods, uh, empirical uh, kind of uh, playful steps. First, to look for trees in the forest. Second, to 3D scan the trees, to 3D model the trees, to CNC cuts the trees and then reassembling them into a, a new space. And after long uh, searching, we found uh, these beautiful ash trees and we used five of these. Um, and the special company then 3D scanned, it's called, um, um, it's called um, topological surface scanning. Here you see these golf balls, which are the coordinates, which we used afterwards. And then we, we got in several steps um, um, a digital mesh model, which we could use. And uh, we tried then to find out how to kind of assemble the trees in the best way together. And, uh, and second, how to hollow out the inside of the trees uh, to create this space. And this was kind of the pyramid was to cut these trees where um, there's very characteristic and beautiful anatomy or, or geometry of the trees and the activity of the play, the climbing, and uh, security issues, more boring. And then uh, a, a special company then uh, programmed a um, digital milling machine, a path for that milling machine after our cutting model. And they cut it that the surface, uh, they milled the surface perfectly after our, after our 3D model, and um, it was super smooth and, and just very, very, very nice combined to the, this rough outside of the trees. You have this kind of, uh, and, and we sliced it, the branches and uh, wove them together into a roof. So it was a very uh, kind of a, a popular playground in the uh, courtyard of the Victoria and Albert Museum. We used uh, the, the roots to come put them together as a foundation, so it was standing by itself. 
and uh, yeah, and, and here you see the climbing. Uh, where it was necessary, there were built-in climbing grips, and um, and uh, and we used also the chippings from the milling process and filled it in the sacks as fall falling protection or fall protection. And this image I found then weeks after when I went to Stockholm in in, in the Vasa Museum. This is a beautiful ship from the 16th century. And the builders of the ship, they went in the forest and they found uh, parts of the trees for, for different parts of the ship. So they had a completely different knowledge about timber and, uh, than we have today, where our timber is industrialized, glue laminated or something. So I, I, I really, it gave us really a, a kind of a possibility to, to rethink timber as a heterogenic material which has its own life, its own possibilities. I'm showing this image because it is, this is the town where, 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 where our office is, and it shows uh, three important um, influences. Uh, the first one is the rough Norwegian nature and coast landscape. The second is uh, the structures and the resources from the oil, of the oil industry. And the third are these vernacular timber houses from, uh, from the coast, typical coast cities along the core. And, uh, and I want to show projects which, which has kind of worked with the different contexts in different ways and to try to relate to these. <coughs> One ongoing um, investigation is the, the amazing tangible and intellectual resources of the petroleum industry in, in Stavanger. And uh, it's transfer value for architecture or urban planning Turgio has already worked with that in the 80s and made very important projects for Stavanger. Even at that time, it was uh, kind of not really understood, or at least you had some problems. <laughs> yeah. uh, I think it hasn't really changed, uh, even though we managed to make one project which I want to show you. It's the Geopark. It was a contribution for uh, when Stavanger was cultural capital in 2000, European cultural capital in 2008, it, in front of the Norwegian Oil Museum and in collaboration with that. It is a youth park for the youth and children, and it, it is kind of woven together of three concepts. First, to, um, to reuse and transform um, elements and materials and technology from the oil industry and build a park Second, to involve children and youth groups to collaborate on the design and the, also the program of this park. And third, to use um, the geological model of uh, the gas and oil reservoir troll uh, as an overarching topographic concept for the park. And we worked together with engineers from Statoil, the national oil company, and got uh, digital models of the, of the gas and oil reservoir and also of its sediments. So mainly what we wanted to do is to show, a, to make a, a landscape which is hidden two to 3,000 meter underneath a seed, seed belt, uh, visible and uh, tangible, and which has been very important for Stavanger's, well, not only for Stavanger, but Norway's health, uh, wealth and place it in front of the oil museum in, in scale one to 500 in the middle of the center. Uh, it is the largest gas reservoir in the world and it mainly consists of 15 uh, sedimentary layers, main layers. So here we see the reconstructed top layer with the, with the drilling wealth. And then we peeled off this layer to expose the different sediments and to, to create a space which orientates towards the middle, like I'm feel like space. And then in, in several workshops with youth groups um, to, to program these different sediments for different activities. Like the yellow is the cultural sediment layer. Then you have here the, the, the skate park. You have the, the jumping layer, the sand play layer, and the chill out layer. 
and then built up these different sediments with uh, recycled elements from uh, mainly the platform Frick, which at that time was dismantled. So we had the privilege to, we could shop like, I want this, this, and we, could, we got like some elements. Here you see uh, the different sediments. And um, here, this, these are the drilling wells, with the horizontal drilling pipes, um, which are built of recycled uh, pipes from scrapyards. Uh, and ma made out this gym equipment and, and skating installations. And the boyers, big boyers, are, are made to, um, to build a roof for the uh, cover for the sta outdoor stage and also to show the top, the, the top layer of the reservoir. And these concrete mats, which normally are used to protect the pipelines on the sea floor, uh, are used to reinforce the steeper parts in the, in the park. And this gigantic uh, ventilation hat is used as to make an outdoor cinema with an LCD screen. And uh, this jumping, as these are fenders, which are made, transformed into a jumping and landscape. And uh, this cover, the protection cover, um, was supposed to, to be the cafe, but there the money went out, so we just kept it empty. And this company you have seen before, they, the same which made the Naked Garden, they cut it, uh, pipes, recycled steel pipes, which then are filled with amplit, the special concrete, to make parts of the landscape. And the folding, the sedimentary folding, which are responsible that there is oil in Troll, are then reconstructed as a con as exhibition walls for street art and graffiti. The gigantic uh, sat satellite dishes are um, acoustic installations, like you can whisper and you hear um, 100 meter, very good. And th this is a personal basket which uh, lifts uh, platform workers up to the platform from the boat, which is the carousel in the So it was meant as a temporary park. Um, uh, we started that project by ourselves uh, and, and tried to, we had always to kind of adjust the design according to the, to the economy. Um, and, and now it became, it was really popular. A lot of kids always using it. So now they're discussing maybe they should keep it or keep parts of it. We don't know what's happening yet, but we still hope. And we did some more recycling projects. Uh, this uh, was a float, uh, a, a, a barge with this um, housing uh, containers for platform workers, which came suddenly into the harbor of Stavanger. It's beautiful to have these big boats coming all the time. And Sif and I really went amok, and we went to the, the bank and you asked for money. And we bought them as many as we could. There were 16 containers and made this housing project in front of our office uh, called B Camp. There are four units. They're going on f each and two floors. And they're made of, uh, and we have a courtyard together with the office. And they, they are made of recycled elements. Also the windows and the doors and, and the cladding and different things are made of recycled elements. The, the, the idea was to make a cheap, uh, kind of apartment building, which was cheap to rent out. But um, it turned out not to be so cheap in the end. So we had some struggle on, on the way. But this led to another project, which uh, someone rang because he, f he read in the newspaper, and he, he, um, he owns modular produced apartments beside a, a big uh, raft. And Instead of demolish, demolishing them, he, he wanted also to reuse them. And that was a, a much larger project, there were 80 units, and uh, also very cheap apartments, which was at that time special in Stavanger. Um, and so this is the origin, original structure, which we then transformed, kind of intervened, uh, saw potentials in, in 
the different situations and also proposed a new floor on the top. So it was uh, sold 80 apartments in two days. Let me see. And the next projects are in the heritage center of Stavanger. And similar to the oil industry, um, we, we tried also to, to learn or to see the qualities of this uh, vernacular timber architecture. It's supposed to be the largest um, heritage center in timber in North Europe. And uh, see what we can learn from it and how we can, uh, what kind of space generating potential is in this structure. And uh, first, we had to get rid of the typical uh, architectural history ballast to, to, to kind of try to recapture a fresh um, approach. And that's why we wanted to make films and wrote stories about the center. And we discovered um, a lot of nice things. For example, that the inhabitants really you, um, they really create um, private uh, oases or free spaces or like um, kind of retreats within this kind of claustrophobic center. And this, this we wanted to rediscover and implement in our one of the first projects, um, two houses um, on, uh, in the center uh, by um, different concepts to uh, combine the spaces and uh, kind of uh, hollow out the ground floor and, and thereby creating spaces which allow larger programs to uh, make uh, terraces and uh, backyards uh, and several entrances for each apartment, optional facades layer where you can choose a degree of privacy and on top kind of more intimate um, spaces with a view towards the um, sea. And, um, that is one idea how to, trans to transfer that with this one apartment where we um, introduced a diagonal bridge with a bed on one side where you have the view out and, uh, and then a balcony or a terrace on the, on the south side. And in the other house, there's a kind of a gap in between the two uh, roofs where you can look out. And this uh, project here, a similar kind of condition that is a very kind of uh, in, a, in a dense uh, timber uh, area where small timber houses are. It's quite a large project, 16 units. And um, we wanted to um, kind of provide um, for each unit a view towards the central lake. And that's why we proposed to bend the facade in and out so that each apartment has a glass facade and a balcony um, towards the lake. And here you see the, the plan solution where the, the apartments are kind of banded out. And at the same time, this kind of zigzag structuring of the facade uh, breaks down the scale and makes like, uh, divides the volumes in three volumes, which kind of match better the in uh, the, the scale of the, of the surrounding timber houses. And the top apartments are stepping down towards the lake and uh, the roof, uh, the characteristic roof like uh, makes that they appear nearly like, like individual houses. They have a large terrace with a view. And the gallery is ending on kind of common terraces which are stepping down towards the the playground, and they also have a view towards the lake. So we, we try to kind of see what what uh, what is the kind of the uh, try to develop methods uh, in this complex context uh, to to invent new new concepts for architecture. And th like in this project with Finn's uh, con uh, bakery, there was a challenge to to extend the bakery. This was before here. And uh, they, he wanted to expand, expand it in, in this house. And we proposed to dismantle the facade in the middle house and ex uh, put in a glass facade in order to create a new entrance and the uh, orientation towards the main square. And uh, the other thing was he wanted um, a space without any columns. 
And it was kind of really difficult because you have these timber houses. And uh, the way we solved that was to open up the bakery in the second floor and to um, uh, utilize the existing log constructions with steel, and thereby creating a hybrid steel construction, a spatial hybrid steel constructions, which uh, makes that this um, are poised above the site without any column, like here. Here, like a framework. So, so you have like one general big space, uh, which is flexible, and then you still can kind of experience the original house structure. So these old log walls and the new interventions that made like a new, a new hole together. And, and we learned a lot about timber architecture and got more and more interested about timber architecture by working in, in Stavanger Center. And, and um, we won then also several competitions like this one, which is the Mountain Lodge. Uh, um, at the trail had leading up to this famous rock, which um, is the, the pulpit rock, which at Lucifer, which is a popular tourist destination. And uh, we wanted that, that, that uh, uh, the massing and the placement of the log is really, of the, of the lodge is really kind of fitted in the immediate landscape. And um, the topographical roof that it really kind of re re reacts to the adjacent topography and, and, and the, the tops. And the... So we found on the side a kind of a flat area um, and, the, the long, and, and also this outcropping rock and proposed to bend the lodge around this rock, uh, which you see here. So here it's the band. And towards the west, where the, there is more a flat um, meadow landscape, the, the roof and the, the, the building height is lower. Towards uh, the east, where there's more rocky landscape and the trail leading up to the, to the, uh, the, to have the, 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 the angle is steeper and the building height is higher, including the, the, the entrance, entrance motif. So beside this kind of uh, trying to, to fit it in the landscape, uh, the, the other thing was important to really try to work with the characteristics of the material and the possibilities of the construction system. And we tried to find a construction system which really fits to this kind of architecture. And, uh, ended up with this 15 uh, double ribs made of prefabricated uh, massive timber elements. And they are hollowed out in, the, in this area to create a generous public space. And um, they give the rhythm for the guest rooms, but also for the more intimate seating areas towards the facade. Then nestling between these double ribs, you have the guest rooms, which are sound isolated because they are double ribs. The roof is made of the same material like the walls and the, the ribs of prefabricated massive timber element. They are isolated and cladded. And we used them a system which is called Holz 100, it's an Austrian system, uh, which um, it consists of different layers and it's uh, bolted together with peach taps which are in swill after being injected. So there is no clue, there is no steel in these elements. They are very environmentally friendly. And they consist of different layers with diagonal layers in the, in the, in the middle and then uh, vertical load-bearing layers and horizontal cladding layers on the outside. And in order to manage the quite big span in the restaurant, we proposed to move the um, diagonal la layers on the outside as to turn the element from the inside out um, in order to, to make the ribs more stiff and also um, better load bear, so, and the engineer and the production company, they agreed to change this industrial product, <coughs> and this really created a, a different expression in the in the restaurant, 
so it's kind of a bottom-up design method where a change of a material really made also in architectural space or the helps to change. Here you see this diagonal layers. And here the peach steps. So it's, it's created their own structure. And the, the niches in between the whips are orientated towards the view. We also designed like outdoor spaces which are part of the architecture and covered, like the entrance space towards the south with um, and, and this, the whips are extended out in the facade to make this seating niche. And in the entrance, there is this um, chimney where you can dry and warm yourself. There's a bridge in the second floor leading to the, the rock with the, the evening sun. And on each side, you have covered terraces uh, with the restaurant here. and and then uh, for the conference room in the second floor. And the roof like fraying out or dissolving on each end, and you have a covered um, escaping stair. The lodge has 28 um, guest rooms. These are the public spaces, flexible. You come in, you have here the cafe, the restaurant, the chimney, the kitchen, guest rooms the guest rooms in the second floor, the library, the conference room. Here you see the section with the bathrooms. And the stepping down towards the conference room from the library, creating different heights. Here's the library. And um, it's really that, that this is uh, like this massive timber elements, they are also creating the surface in the, in the, in the log. So you, it's um, smelling timber in the, in, the, in the whole lodge. The bathrooms are glass boxes in the space. And you see here that the, the massive timber, uh, timber uh, fiber isolation the timber, pressed timber plate, waxed, and the cladding. So there's no plastic no, in this wall. It's, it's breathing and uh, only timber used. There were very complicated details to really combine all this. So it was like a, a, a puzzle. And we had to model every of the 400 elements, also 3D model, together with the engineer and the production company. But then we really have control over the geometry. And this is a plan from the, one of the 16 trucks. This also has to be planned, how the elements are piled up. The cladding is hardcore pine, untreated. And for the interior, we proposed like, to use uh, local craftsmanship, which is still alive. Like, for example, uh, the seat mats to cover the acoustic plates. And, um, this woven veneer and the furniture. So this, um, as Peter said, it's got the prize last year for the award for architecture in, in Norway. And, um, and it's going quite well. And at the same time, uh, we proposed something for children. Because if the, the, the adults go in this cabin and they the drink red wine and so that the kids can go around in the area around and have their own cabins, which is called a base camp. And uh, there you see the tree houses hanging the trees connected with the uh, bridges. And the whole point with base camp was that the children should learn to, to, to make food and to play and, and to live and to, to have a in, in nature and really kind of experience that. So they are covered with uh, cotton, and there are three children can sleep in each of these. And the second base camp is a cliffhanger. It's hanging on steel wires. You have to climb up, and uh, they, they create a distance to the rock. And in between the steel pressure sticks, the, the, the beds are mounted. So in order to come to your bed, you have to climb up the rocks. And if you fall down, you fall down to your neighbor. So these are also falling protections. And we painted the, the, the cracks, which are behind the cotton, 
on the outside and made like the windows in between these cracks. Third base camp is uh, the water cabin. Uh, it's built into the natural bay. And uh, here you see it's, it's a K more or less. It also has a handicap uh, um, toilet, which makes it universal designed also. Uh, and it's a, more or less a covered K where you sleep in hammocks in between the columns. And if it's uh, cold or rainy, you roll down this, this textile. And you come there with a boat. The next project is a competition we won in 2006, which is now under construction. It is in a city in Venesla in South uh, Norway. Um, it is in between an existing cinema and an um, adult um, um, education center. This is the site. And we won this competition because we had a very compact project which um, solved the whole library nearly on one floor and which uh, cut it into this roof and made like a funnel-like gesture towards this main square. And uh, we developed that uh, whip concept which we had in the uh, Pulpit Rock Mountain Lodge further and made, tried to make multifunctional whips which um, not only are constructions but they are also uh, the, the, the ducts for the air conditioning and there are the furniture and there are uh, the lightning and have all the technical devices. And um, so each, each of these whips consists of one uh, glue laminated tim beam, uh, an absorbent which encloses the air conditioning duct, lightning, a curved uh, glass cover which is also the design, uh, furniture and um, ventilation, uh, included ventilation. And you have here the culvert in the ground which goes all the way to the building and uh, blowing in fresh, fresh air in the whips. It's a section with the absorbent and uh, the general massive timber element in the roofs in between the whips. This is a mock-up of a carpenter who who, who did that last week, uh, we showed the part of a section of the whip. And the whole building consists of 26 uh, whips, which um, are also CNC cutted precisely, so they determinate the geometry of the, of the whole building and the roof and the massive timber on top. So the space is quite a general space, but also then gives the whips give like more intimate reading zones uh, and um, also a good orientation in the library. Here you see that uh, this is a foyer, the existing cinema, the restaurant, newspapers, magazines, the main part of the library here. And wardrobes, the section, it's on a split level. And we also included the passage so that to, to get passers-by into the, uh, the library. View from top out. This also will be built in environmentally friendly materials like the Pulpit Rock Mountain Lodge in the same way and also with low energy standard. And the last whip is like a loggia with the same width as the main square and makes like a covered protected outdoor space. So we wanted to make a library where it's, it's kind of easy, accessible, and drags people into the space. This project is an urban planning project and a housing project, uh, 360 units, um, which we made together with the Vienna-based office, uh, DR, uh, PPAG. And it is in a suburbia area, and we wanted to um, really um, kind of try to avoid the typical sub sub suburbanization and by combining qualities of the living conditions in the city with the quality of living at the countryside or more rural. And this we did in different ways. We wanted that the roads are connecting existing roads and uh, 
they are kind of curved or, or undulated formed, universal designed, but also <coughs> reducing the speed and that it creates an experience to drive through these roads. And they are expanding to squares uh, or shared spaces. And then there are playgrounds which connect the shared, shared spaces with each other. They have different forms of play. And uh, there are also path, um, footpath and bicycle path connecting these places. And then you have uh, existing stone walls with a beautiful vegetation, which we then upgrade to the common green areas. And uh, private gardens and different typologies, which are around these co this courtyards or squares. And there are housing blocks, units with four or five, as a buildings with four or five units uh, and one family houses. So we wanted to make a, a, a kind of a weave which connects the area to the surrounding areas and makes it kind of transparent. This is the first uh, construction phase of 120 units, which is under construction now. Here you see the different typologies. The, blo the blocks are blue, the four or five unit buildings are pink, and then the one family houses, yellow and orange. The other principle was we call blitz, not, not blitzkrieg, but blitz, which is uh, show, helping to get as much sunlight on into the squares as possible, and at the same time also views out from the, from the different units. So to make a porous kind of structure around these courtyards. Uh, and to create really sun, maximum sun in these quite dense structures and views out. There are beautiful views all around. And there are different typologies, housing typologies, about two, 20 to 30 around one courtyard in order to create a heterogenic neighborhood. You see this, uh, the, the one, one of these courtyards. And here you see all the courtyards after each other. So they are all different, and they include the entrance to all apartments and playgrounds and uh, social meeting places, but also parking and, and car access. And this is uh, one typology, which is uh, the one family house where with a two floor high dining room and a large living room on the, in the third floor with the roof terrace, which is the whole um, settlement is built in massive timber and it's a passive house standard. So it's the largest passive house project in Norway at the time. And it has a kind of intention to really be environmentally friendly in all aspects. And it's cladded with, um, a, a, it's called cabonets. It's, it's a kind of a ecological impregnation. So it's maintenance free. Here you see this um, two floor high living room and the stairs up leading up to the third floor where you have also a living room with uh, the roof towers. This typology is a five, uh, has five units, and it connects also different, so there are passages through these typologies, and it connects different, um, different courtyards. And uh, the idea here is that the apartment goes uh, in a spiral up, up, so they are like intertwined, so all the apartments have different, they're going in spirals up and up, and they, they have different orientations. See that here? and the stairs are, are put on top of each other. So this then, this kind of a living room goes up to this, this floor then. And this, this screen goes up to this one living room. These are the blocks, three units per floor with, with terraces. Uh, this is one typology designed of PPAG. And um, this is the kindergarten, which is also under construction now. This is the other 
block which is under construction now. The last project is uh, a competition we won in uh, two years ago. It is um, the Norwegian Pavilion for the Expo 2010 in Shanghai. And as you, as you probably know, the theme of the Expo was uh, a better city, a better life. It is about sustainable urban development. And to build or design a pavilion for a lot of money for the duration of 180 days is, is the opposite of sustainability. <laughs> so that uh, was kind of the starting point for us. And, to make, and that's why we wanted to include the life cycle or the after use of the pavilion in, already in the conceptual phase. And uh, we wanted to make a, a, a space which consists of different components uh, which uh, are self-sustained but then uh, can, be, can be easily dismantled and re-erected again. And in the expo period, they are assembled like to a forest or the Norwegian pavilion. And after expo, you can use each of these uh, trees uh, as a social meeting place or a shaded park installation or um, yeah, as a playground but you also can use them together in assembled. And Norway's contribution was to kind of make a space which reflects on the, how, how we can create a rec recreational spaces in the city and how, how we can, can got contact to, with nature in, in, in a city development. And here you see each it's a very simple structure. It's four branches, one trunk, four roots, and a pretensioned membrane roof. And it's made uh, of laminated timber, um, Norwegian laminated timber. Originally, we wanted to use glue bam, which is a Chinese product uh, and very interesting product, but this was not possible to get approved in China in this short period. And then this is extended with a layer of, um, we call it add-ons, of C and C cutted um, bamboo plates, which uh, kind of um, includes all the technical infrastructure, like uh, yeah, air conditioning and water sprinkling and lightning, but also the exhibition like monitors or the exhibition space. So, so we wanted to make a structure which, which kind of, um, which is very simple, but at the same time multifunctional and including everything. Instead of making a pavilion, like the, most pavilions are like black boxes where the architect makes a, a piece and then there comes like the exhibition afterwards into the, and, and designed into this black box. But we, we wanted that this kind of is synthesized together in a, in a simple structure. This one test tree in, built in Norway. And the uh, Chinese uh, company came to Norway to learn how to assemble the tree. And it's the first tree going into a container shipped to, to the expo site and built up. It takes only five hours to build up this tree. And uh, we really had, our heart was at the relocation. We wanted this relocation, uh, we use be something which is, um, really developed and we worked with three different universities with um, Wuhan in Shanghai and in, in uh, Guangzhou and uh, to, to find out how to, to reuse the structure. It was very difficult with, uh, not with the Chinese authorities but with the Norwegian authorities. They really um, didn't support that idea. But um, now the pavilion is sold we don't know yet to whom. It's still not official because of the Nobel Prize. They want to not uh, say who bought the pavilion. So we hope that this will be an interesting process and that we can include students further in that. This was one idea of <laughs> the vertical park. You see the membrane roof, facades, the 15 trees, and the exhibition. 
and uh, the entrance here, where you walk in a kind of a line through this, and here you have the restaurant and the business center. The coast, the, the forest, the fjords, and the Arctis. So there was a kind of um, idea to, the, the, the exhibition is dealing with the theme how, what is special about Norway is that, that the um, cultural activities and uh, nature are really very complex interwoven. And, and this kind of interface should be kind of shown not only in the physical design of the exhibition, but also in the monitors. And, um, and, and, and this should give association to different landscapes. Here you see the fjords, which are kind of plates which are CNC cutted and they include text which is imprinted on the, on the whips and uh, also the monitors. So this is uh, the one, one wood section and the coast which um, um, the, where the woods are kind of wave-like structures which includes also monitors. And uh, the forest, where you have a silhouette, which uh, is like a city silhouette, and the mountain silhouette, which includes monitors. And uh, shown the kind of how people use nature and city in small sculptures. And the CNC cutted leaves are then casted into the ground. Here you see the whole structure. And on the construction side, it was nice because it was the only pavilion in timber where the construction was in timber. All the other ones are in concrete or steel. And, uh, and also, the construction you saw in the, in the, it was not covered with plates. So it was like the structure was still visible in the end of the. Here you see the pretensioned membrane. We did that with the engineer from Stuttgart. There are amazing engineers in Stuttgart in the like, disciples of Fray Otto. This is Knippos and Helbig, the company. And each, each tree is designed in a way that it can stand free afterwards. So it it's, can stand together and it can stand free. So it's the entrance uh, tree where you have a shaded area for the, the queue. Entrance tree. And we wanted also a pavilion which, which is transparent that you can look in. It's not like a black box. You can experience the inside. And the woods on the outside are also quite often used as slides or benches. So uh, that we try to, to kind of weave together these qualities of different contexts and really see the space generating potential of this. If it is now the oil industry or the, the if it's the, um, the heritage center and combine it with the uh, human resources and in human interaction, like we did the particip participation projects or include users and with the intrinsic qualities of the material like, like timber. And, 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 and knit that together into a kind of a space. And that, that is what I tried, as we tried in these this projects. Thank you. Reinhardt was kind enough to offer that we will answer a question. So, uh, in Hungary, I didn't have any microphone. I have now two, you know, now I think it. Uh, and we'll carry it around so who will ask the question. Can you turn the mics off? It's, it's on. The other one is going to need to be put that one on. Yeah, turn on.
Any questions? <laughs> Maybe I, I have one observation more than question that it's very interesting to see how you dealt with planar elements and sometimes they are forming volumes, sometimes they are sort of turned inside out and forming linear elements. So was this a kind of, uh, not a style, but an approach which you uh, noticed, or it's just happened to in this way that as a consequence of the material, the, the wooden panels. Um, yeah, sometimes this, this happens when, um, when we try to combine, to, to synthesize different aspects of architecture, like uh, the technology you have in a building, like contextual influences, and then, of course, the material in itself. And then when you allow that to, to kind of mingle, and, and, and then you sometimes you, you, you break, the, uh, you, break you, you get kind of interesting results in the architecture. And like in the Pulpit Rock Mountain Lodge, this kind of, for example, this ways to develop the whips and how the whips become something which we then further in the in Venice law, which becomes like shells or becomes like a architectural elements, like space in space. This, um, this is a, a result of, I think, this, this wish to, to synthesize or to, to kind of make, make a weave, like a carpet in a way. I mean, I think really that architecture should not be analytically in the way that you separate certain elements out of what is a part of space. And, and that's all for urban planning. That's that's we tried in, in the Scott backpack and do. Yeah. But really I remember yeah. when I looked up the word composition, it means weaving together. So mm -hmm. that's your method, mm -hmm. I think. Anybody would like to ask something? Um, I just noted noticed with a couple of your projects that you would um, give some of the research to um, various like scientists or mathematicians um, or you did like a like the topological um, surface scanning and all in an effort to get back to nature um, so just wondering how you see these um, highly technological systems working to go back to nature mm -hmm. That's a good question. Um, I think um, the I think that two things. First, I think it's really a new uh, kind of a time for architects to think about how nature can what what architecture can learn of nature, um, because um, be because uh, there is so much um, waste and pollution in the building. In, in the whole way we work as architects, that this is needed. This is something which, which architects can kind of be the inventors, like in the modernism, where the kind of suddenly the industrialization uh, gave incredible possibilities for architects to position themselves as really as creators. Uh, and that is now possible again, I think. But the important thing is that you can't go back to nature in the kind of a romantic way that the nature is so beautiful and you're making like formal uh, gestures and you, you kind of take a, I, I don't think this is going back to, to, to humans, that humans should experience nature. It doesn't go back to linguistic concepts about nature. I think it goes, there is no way around natural science because natural science is so far ahead in how, um, how, how they have like explained the world that, that on a philosophical level, natural science has to be included if you want to be relevant as an architect. And that is, I think, is the interesting thing, that through digital technology, uh, you go away through the in industrialization, which we are kind of embedded in. You can go, kind of shortcut um, this uninteresting kind of inert use of technology and inert use of natural science by um, shortcutting uh, digital technology with nature. 
uh, or, or use of natural resources or kind of, and, and that is something which uh, is amazing potential, I think, which we tried in our first two projects to explore and we tried with the massive timber elements and so on, but still, this, I think this is something which will be extremely interesting for architects in the future. Um, and that is um, a different way to work with nature than like the Scandinavian history is used to work with nature, like Arvaldo, or they, they all, there is a long history about how to work with nature, but this, I think there's a new possibility about how to work with nature. Another uh, observation and question, if, if it is so, that uh, reinvention of craft in the industrial age was very interesting to mm. see when you inverted the panels and you took the diagonals, which is the traditional way of siding uh, outside, but it was industrially uh, prefer prepared. Mm. So it was very interesting that the reference to history and reference to historical craft appeared in the industrial scale. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, that, that is really something which we are interested in because the craft, the knowledge craft, craftsmanship has is a different one. It is embedded in the, in the materiality and in a, in a context. And this, this is an incredible resource. And if that is possible to get back into the project, not to go back to kind of um, craft buildings, but to get it into a more in the new production modes. Yes. That has a, a really interesting potential, I think. And that there was, again, I think the interesting thing about to be an architect is exactly that you are in a position to, to combine that. Uh, I think that's this, the, the amazing thing about our conf profession, that we can propose to combine that. And, and that, that, I think that is a much more potential for in, inventions, spatial inventions, than all these kind of diagrams and linguistic concepts, which you always saw, in, especially in the 90s, it was polluted of this stuff, this Dutch, in, uninteresting Dutch kind of repetition, 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 it's still going on. I think there was a, a very different, um, kind of a, a, a different, now a possibility to go away from that, that dom dominant. And then I think craftsmanship can go, come back in, yes. in a different way. Yes, mm. absolutely. Well, I can hold on like this. <laughs> All right. Um, well, I know that um, the projects that we have seen is also a result of a certain stubbornness. Could you uh, elaborate on uh, what that might entail? <laughs> yeah, that, that's uh, good that you, 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 you have that as well. I think that's, uh, um, I, think, I think that's something uh, you know, uh, which, um, I think it's, uh, the thing is that you, um, like Steve and I say, we never give up, we just bite like a Rottweiler, and then we never keep, leave the project. And even though this is not that we are kind of fighting and, uh, but, but this kind of, you, you, you are not allowed to give up as an architect and you are not allowed to complain because everything you can't achieve, it's your fault. I mean, you can't blame other ones. And I think that's uh, really important as, you know, as students that, that, that you, you, you have to be like that as a, also as a student. And that kind of, um, uh, then it's interesting that, that if you um, keep the grip, um, slowly the things are changing. And as this is one thing. And the other thing I think is important at the same time is um, that if I think the, the, at least the, 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 um, there are a lot of architects who are kind of very proud to be warriors. And I, I don't think this is something to be proud of. It's just have something you have to fight. But there's not where the creativity lies, in my opinion. Sometimes it does. But mostly, so, so there's a kind of, a, I think, um, interesting um, 
in, in Stavanger is a small city, and it's interesting to find the kind of st strategies to not go into confrontation, but you still fight, and in a different way. Um, this is their own lecture, I think. <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, anyway, you have um, the stubbornness, yes. Mm -hmm. We. Um, Anybody else, please? Last comment or question? So then we thank you very much for the beautiful lecture. And also... Thank you.